So have you ever been reading Pride and Prejudice and you just think that the Regency era sounds like a great place to live in? You're like, this is the culture of my heart. Well, in today's video, we're going to be analyzing the culture of the Regency era because just like different countries in the world have their own distinctive culture, the Regency era has a time in history, definitely had a culture that was very defined and different from many of our cultures today. What we're going to be doing today is analyzing the Regency era as a culture. And as we go through this, you can see how your culture matches up against the Regency era. Does it have a lot in common or is your culture totally different from how they lived back then? Well, before we get into that, let me just introduce myself really quick. My name is Ellie Dashwood and this is my channel where we talk about history and literature. If you like either of those things, please subscribe. So first of all, let's just talk about the fact that different periods in time have their own culture. I I think sometimes we can think of a country having a culture, but really the different eras had a distinctive culture as in what they valued and what they wore. And so to really analyze the culture that did exist back then, we're going to be looking at it as a iceberg and we're also going to be breaking it down on four basic cultural dimensions. So first up, culture as an iceberg. So most of you guys have probably seen some sort of chart that looks like this in sociology class in school. But basically, there are so many different aspects to a culture. And of course, if it was an iceberg, all of those aspects that are plainly visible above water are things that we can easily see. And the Regency era has a lot of these. For example, their fashion is very well documented. They produced a lot of art and architecture and even furniture. There was a massive development development and how they designed and kept their gardens. And then of course there's things like the works of Jane Austen or of Byron. And these are the things they usually try to visually replicate in period dramas. Of course how well they do with that is like a whole other topic, but you know, they're trying to get that part of this cultural iceberg. What's interesting is then, of course, if we move underwater, there are all these different facets that are harder to see, such as how did they view the family structure? How did they view money, social position, status? Basically, what did they hope for in life? What did they fear? What assumptions about the universe and life itself did they hold that had effects on how they made all the decisions in their life? These ideas result in those aspects that we can physically see because of course everything we physically see comes from what we can't see and so everything visible about the Regency era is springing from these deep inner beliefs they had about life and society. And so these would be all of those elements again underwater. They're harder to see. So so while the deep culture or the bottom of the cultural iceberg can be harder to see, by analyzing things like classic literature, we start to be able to understand how they truly viewed the world. And so in this next section, we're going to be looking at the Regency era's deep culture by analyzing it on four basic cultural dimensions that really all of our cultures have. But before we get into that, here's a quick message from Promo Ellie. Promo Ellie here, wanting to tell you about this awesome product sent to me by my friends at Chalkboard Maps. So a chalkboard map is a durable, rollable, magnetic map that is made of advanced chalkboard material. And on their website, they have the Europe, world and US maps available. And they gave me the world map to review. And I have to say it's super fun to use. But really my favorite part of chalkboard maps is how reusable they are. Compared to a scratch off map or a push pin map that get destroyed as you use them, chalkboard maps just simply wipe clean. They pair with liquid chalk markers, a few of which are included with every map. And also I went on Amazon and bought these liquid chalk markers because you know, they're my brand colors and they're pretty. <laughs> And it's super fun because you can write on the map, color on the map, plan out the different trips you want to take or journal places you've been. But if you mess up, you can easily wipe it away. And once you get tired of a certain map design, you can just wipe the whole thing down and start new. Also, because it's magnetic, you can hang up either special photo magnets that you can buy through the Chalkboard Maps app, or you can just use basic magnets to hang up your favorite travel photos and mementos. They actually sell these super cute push pin magnets, which I think have this really great vintage vibe. So if you want to learn more about chalkboard maps, then definitely click the link in the description below.
below. In this next section, we're going to be using some four basic cultural dimensions. And these have been identified by some cross-cultural researchers such as Brooks Peterson. And basically what these dimensions do is give us a spectrum on different topics that cultures tend to vary on. So for example, the very first spectrum we can look at is the hierarchy versus equality spectrum. So basically all cultures fall along the spectrum between being very hierarchical and structured, or they could be very based on equality and a lack of vertical structure in that way. And because these are a spectrum, usually no society is 100% one way or 100% the other way. They could lean a little bit to one side or they could be very on one side, but each culture has its certain level of either hierarchy or equality going on. And while I go through these dimensions today, I'm going to be comparing and contrasting it with my own culture of being from America, just for reference. But while watching, you can be comparing it to your own culture to see how much your culture lines up with the Regency era on these major spectrum points. So again, returning to this hierarchy versus equality spectrum, what we see with the Regency era is it was extremely hierarchical. So much so. Of course, they had a very set social hierarchy, including an order of precedence, both in larger societies, such as we had the king, and then we had the royal family, and then we had the nobility. Basically, there was literally a line of people who ranked above other people in society. And then again, we see this even on a smaller scale within the family. Obviously, the husband was 100% the head of the family, and then there was the wife. And even among the children, if you see my video on does Mr. Darcy have a first name, where I talk about how the oldest sister in a family gets to use Miss last name, which is why Jane Bennett is Miss Bennett. And then her younger sisters have to be Miss first name, last name. And of course, we usually see the Bennett girls in Pride and Prejudice adaptations walking in the order of their birth. And so we see these strict hierarchies maintained even within the family. So now that we know that the Regency era was definitely a hierarchical society. Let's compare and contrast this with modern American society. To say that modern American society really likes equality would be a sort of extreme understatement. I do think that Americans do not like the concept of anybody being better than them. We're all equal. And I think one way we do see this is through how people address each other. Even within America, culture varies by where you live. So for example, when I was a little kid, I was taught that I was to address all adults by their title of Mr. Mrs. and then their last name. And that was how I showed respect for adults. I was a little kid and they were adults and I needed to respect them. And what's interesting is about halfway through elementary school, I moved to a different state. And to my surprise and shock, that hierarchical difference did not exist. Pretty much in the area where I moved to, all little kids called almost all adults their by their first name, with the exception of their teachers at school or doctors. Like a little three-year-old would walk up to an 80-year-old and be like, hey, Joe, how are you? And it made me so uncomfortable because I'm like, I don't think we're supposed to do that. And it was this really hard transition for me for a long time because, of course, there was like this breakdown of the respectful title hierarchy. And it was all about equality. And I do think when it comes to this hierarchical structure, at least American society is very, very different from Regency society. Moving on to the next dimension of culture, let's talk about direct versus indirect societies. So for example, some cultures when saying no, they're very direct. Somebody asks you if you wanna to go to a party with them and you're just like, no. That would be a very direct culture. Meanwhile, there's cultures that are more indirect, where they like to say no in incredibly roundabout ways. So for example, I have a friend from Germany, and he said when he first moved to America, it took him a while to get used to how many different things actually mean no. So for example, if you ask your friend, hey, do you want to go to a party? An American might say, oh, wow, I would love to. I might have to check my schedule, though. I've been really busy lately. I don't know if I'll fill up to it. 
Do you see how that was like, no, but it took three sentences and it never actually said no, but that's just an example of a more indirect culture. Or for example, sometimes other cultures are very fine with just saying something like, yeah, that person died. Where in America, we tend to be like, yeah, they passed away, they moved on. We have all of these sort of indirect euphemisms to describe the fact that somebody died because we don't like to say they died. Anyway, when looking at the Regency era, it does seem to hold a lot of those indirect characteristics. In fact, let's look at how Elizabeth Bennet turns down Mr. Collins. So he asks her to marry him, and this is how she responds. You are too hasty, sir, she cried. You forget that I have made no answer. Let me do it without further loss of time. Accept my thanks for the compliment you are paying me. I am very sensible of the honor of your proposals, but it is impossible for me to do otherwise than to decline them. So that was a lot of sentences to say just to say no. So that's a perfect example of being very indirect. And I think too, it's interesting to look at the rules of dancing with people at balls. Pretty much a young woman could not decline a man who asks her to dance, except under certain circumstances. Obviously one, that she already has a partner for that dance. Clearly she can't have two partners. Another one is if she's not planning to dance for the rest of the night. So if some guy comes up to you and asks you to dance, pretty much if you just really, really don't wanna dance with him, you have to be like, oh, I'm not dancing tonight. And then you don't get to dance with anyone else for the rest of the night. Otherwise it would be this huge insult to him. The third thing a young lady could do would be to say that she was too tired and needed to sit down for this dance. But even that technically wouldn't get rid of the guy because he was supposed to then be gallant and be like, oh, well in that case, I will sit with you and keep you company through the dance because what I really wanted was your company and not necessarily the dance. So then now she has to sit with this guy that maybe she was trying to avoid for the whole dance that could take up to half an hour. But as we see here, even built into the rules of accepting and declining people at a ball, it's a very indirect. She doesn't get to just say, no, I don't want to dance with you in any of the options. Meanwhile, what about American culture today? Well, at least thankfully now, if a guy asks you out and you're like, no, you can just say no if you want to. But I do think America is definitely still more an indirect culture. Like I talked about with my friend moving from Germany to America and having to learn all the different ways we say no. This is one of those aspects that America is more like the Regency on as compared to any of the other aspects. So the next cultural dimension up is the individual versus the group. So some societies are very collective. They like to view themselves as part of a group, such as their family, their class in school, their work group, their country as a whole. Whatever it is, is they are a part of the group and they tend to see life through the lens of what will be best for the entire group. So for example, if I make this decision, how will it affect everyone else in my group? Will it benefit them? Will it hurt them? What should I do? Meanwhile, more individualistic cultures tend to be all about the individual. They think, well, what do I want to do? What are my dreams? I need to go follow them no matter how else it affects everyone. And really, how does the Regency measure up on these dimensions? Well, the Regency was a very group based society. Editing Ellie here, just wanting to jump in because I don't think I did a very good the first time explaining this topic. But basically with a group culture, one of the defining features I think we see is this concept of a group shame, where one member of a group can bring shame on all the other members. You know, the classic, you have brought dishonor on our family type concept. And this is something we actually see happening in Pride and Prejudice when Lydia runs off with Wicca and we see this actually pointed out very directly by both Mr. Collins and Lady Catherine. So Mr. Collins tells Lady Catherine all about the Lydia Bennett fiasco, and here is what he writes in a letter to Mr. Bennett about it. They agree with me in apprehending that this false step in one daughter will be injurious to the fortunes of all the others. For who, as Lady Catherine herself condescendingly says, will connect themselves with such 
a family. And this consideration leads me moreover to reflect with augmented satisfaction on a certain event of last November. For had it been otherwise, I must have been involved in all your sorrow and disgrace. So basically here we have Mr. Collins talking about this concept of group shame because Lydia ran off with Mr. Wickham. The whole family is now in disgrace and nobody now wants to join their group or their family because they would also be involved in this disgrace and shame. So when we do talk about this group, we see Lydia affecting the whole rest of the group through her actions. Meanwhile, in more individualistic societies, individual members of any group are treated still as individuals. For example, if my friend's sister ran off with Mr. Wickham, I'd be like, that's so sad. What can I do to help? But I wouldn't judge my friend about it. I wouldn't be like, your family is in shame and disgrace. And so I do think this is a hallmark of America being a very individualistic society. Now, I think it's important to note, too, that these spectrums, such as the one between an individual versus a group culture, aren't good or bad. One side isn't bad, another side isn't good. Each sides have their own positives and negatives. For example, group cultures can also have a positive of people being more loyal or caring about their groups. So, for example, in Pride and Prejudice, when Elizabeth Bennet marries Mr. Dark she's becoming the head of a very huge household that includes all of the servants. And huge households and their servants were referred to as the family, and they were viewed as the family with the mistress being the mother of it. And as the mistress, Elizabeth's whole life would have been dedicated to helping take care of her servants, knowing all of their names. If one of them got sick, she would get them the appropriate medical care. If there was a servant who'd been in service to the family for a long time and was older, she would go and visit them. And that would be her responsibility as part of the household group at Pemberley. And it's highly unlikely Elizabeth Bennet would have ever woken up one day and been like, you know what? I don't care about the servants. They're just sort of reigning on my own thing. I want to go do my own thing. I want to follow my dreams. And taking care of six servants is not one of them. Right, she wouldn't wake up one day and act like a member of a more individualistic society where it's all about your own personal dreams in the world. So for some reason, I see this all the time on American television where they'll be a married couple and nothing's super wrong with their marriage, but suddenly one day they just wake up and they're like, you know what? We're not in love anymore. And the wife is like, you want to be a lawyer in New York, but I have this new dream of becoming an underwater archaeologist in Romania. And you being a lawyer in New York is just not lining up with that. So I'm going to go do my own thing. And I guess our kids are just going to have to deal with it. That is a much more individualistic look at a group structure where the personal desires and decisions are put ahead of what might be best for the group. The fourth and last cultural dimension that we're going to be looking at here today is the difference between a relationship-based society and a task based society, which is where does success come from? And so really a relationship-based society would answer really how you get anywhere in life is based on who you know and who you can network with, while a task-based society is more like, no, personal hard work and achievement is the key to advancement. So where is the Regency era at on this dimension? Well, they were a very relationship-based society. It was heavy on the social networking. It was so much on the who you know gets you a promotion over how hard you work. We see this in Jane Austen's own life. Her father was always writing to some of their relatives and acquaintances, trying to get promotions for his son who were in the Navy because he very well understood that it was who you know that mattered. Of course, Jane Austen's brothers weren't slackers. They were very hard workers in the Navy, but honestly, that wasn't really going to get them too far without the additional help from others behind the scenes. We saw a lot of older brothers helping their younger brothers get promotions in the army. This was a huge way that people got different parishes when they were clergymen in the Church of England. It was all who you knew, who you were related to, who could 
recommend you for this position? I have an entire video on how to make social calls in the Victorian era, which while that's about the Victorian era, pretty much a variation of the same thing that was happening in the Regency era. And it was for women this constant round of social calls because again, who you know is more important than necessarily how good you are at anything. And I think too, because the Regency era was such a relationship-based culture, they would have all liked this video because they were like, you know who we need to social network with? Ellie Dashwood. She could probably help us somehow. Okay, actually, no, I would have like zero social clout if I lived in the Regency era. Be like, who are you? You are weird. But hopefully they would still like my video. And if you would be interested in liking this video, then please do so. Thank you. Meanwhile, how does this stack up against modern day America? America is a strange mixture. So Americans do have this idea that it should be about how hard you work. It should be about how well you perform. Does it always necessarily work out like that in real life though? Again, questionable. But when nepotism does happen, that's looked down upon. That's like, hey, that's not fair. You just hired them for this job because they're your second cousin. They're not even good at anything. And so that's looked down upon as not great. While opposed in the Regency era, that would have been looked on as standard. So those are the four dimensions of culture. Again, they were the hierarchy versus the equality, the direct culture versus the indirect culture, the collective group culture versus the individualistic culture, and the task-based culture versus the relationship-based culture. And on so many of these basic dimensions, the Regency era is almost the exact opposite of at least my modern day American culture. And I think this does just show too that the Regency really did. They had a distinctive, measurable culture of their own. And I think this brings up an interesting topic of like, does this culture then deserve respect? Because of course, growing up, I was always taught like no cultures, better than any other culture. We should respect all the cultures. And I do think this is an idea that is pretty common. But for some reason, when it comes to culture and history, we as modern people think that we can judge it. We can be like, well, it was just dumb back then. They were all super backward. They didn't know what they were doing. Just because instead of it being a culture in a different country, it's a culture in a different time. And I think too, it's important to remember that the culture was so real. It wasn't that surface tip of the iceberg. It went deep with inside these people. These are the deepest beliefs they held ever since they were very small children, which I think too brings in this issue, which is something I do see in a lot of historical fiction, where there's a rejection of the culture, or there's simply a dressing up of modern values in Regency costume, pretty much. It's like a totally modern character, but they're wearing a bonnet and then now it's historical. When really there is a total ignoring of their actual deep cultural values. And so basically what I'm saying is that the Regency having its own culture is important to remember and also how we approach and understand and whether we judge or we don't judge that culture is also important to take into consideration. Anyway, that is all of my ramblings on the culture of the Regency era. My name is Ellie Dashwood and this is my channel where we talk about history and literature. If you like either of those things, then please subscribe and keep having an awesome day because you're awesome. Bye!